The Zimmerman and Ryder paper that uh, that resulted, I wish that we were talking about with the with the decrease in near infrared radiation that we're being exposed to over time since basically since before the Industrial Revolution, um, since we've moved more and more inside with more and more protection uh, from the sun, um, they basically they propose what we've now already been talking about. But their hypothesis this is published in 2019. Um, is, and I'm just giving a little backup, is that melatonin and sunlight are linked. We know this. Um, but melatonin comes in two forms. I've already said this, but I just want to be very sort of formal about it. Circulatory and subcellular, which have very different relationships with the sun. So the hypothesis that they propose in this 2019 uh, paper that's published in the journal that I had never heard of before called Melatonin Research is circulatory melatonin is produced in response to the absence of sunlight and subcellular melatonin is produced in response to the presence of sunlight, which itself is uh, you know, remarkable that the same hormone is going to be produced by opposite, opposite triggers. You know, the sa- it's the same input and it's it, with a binary state of yes, there is or no, there isn't. And in each of those states, a different, a different source of the melatonin is triggered to produce it. Now, I will bet... Mm-hmm that there is a elegant story that unites these things that it's not mm, just yes. contradictory yep. but it's a little bit like you know yeah. the uh the result um uh that the triggering of your body by adrenaline right. activates certain things it speeds up your mental processing for example and shuts down your gut right, right? is it an up regulator or a down regulator well it's a i'm running from that scary thing regulator and yeah. mm-hmm. um and the point is different thing you know some things get put uh, yes. put off in that circumstance and other things get amped up mm-hmm. and my guess is going to be that the reason that melatonin is showing up in both places and the reason that the pattern is inverse is mm-hmm. going to be one of these like hey that's your your awake yeah. system and then mm-hmm. etc by the way your awake system would need to know something about your asleep system and vice versa right exactly so here's just uh, a couple of paragraphs from near the end of this uh, 2019 paper published in melatonin research and you can show my screen if you like zach sunlight and the optical properties of our surroundings guaranteed that for millions of years most cells in the human body especially in children were always exposed to predominantly near infrared photons during the day and for 600,000 years as groups gathered around the campfire in the evening before bedtime. This continued for the last 150 years based on the excessive amounts of near-infrared radiation emitted by incandescent bulbs. 50 years ago, fluorescent bulbs started to eliminate near-infrared from the artificial environment, but the incandescent lights continued to provide near-infrared, especially in homes. Recent government mandates have begun a process that will, for the first time in the history of our species, eliminate most of the near-infrared exposure that once dominated. These changes are being driven by government mandates and will be universally implemented over the next couple of decades. With 90% of our time under artificial lighting and in front of displays that emit zero near-infrared, and with near-infrared blocking window treatments preventing near-infrared from entering our offices, schools, and homes, modern societies have created near-infrared caves. As figure S9 illustrates, most researchers are aware that we are eliminating night by exposing ourselves to excessive amounts of visible emission in our signage, streetlights, headlights, lighting, computer screens, and displays. What most researchers do not realize is that for the first time, 70% of the spectrum emitted by the sun through near, in, in the form of near-infrared is being eliminated from our lives during the day. And just one more thing. As the Roundup lawsuits clearly illustrate, there is an added level of responsibility and liability associated with globally altering the public's environment. As shown above, the human body has evolved and adapted processes based on the assumption that it is exposed daily to a single, predominantly near-infrared broadband fixed emitter, the sun. That assumption is no longer valid. Over the next several decades, the government will convert all lighting to visible-only emitters with little understanding as to the long-term health consequences. Um, Or stated otherwise, hypernovelty is a cold bitch. (laughs) And I thought actually, um, there's much more to do here, but I thought actually to read the epilogue to our book here because it fits. We didn't we didn't know this yep. when we wrote this book. Um, this is a hunter-gatherer's guide to the 21st century. Um, we didn't know what I just read uh, here. Um, and oh, actually one more, show, just show that final screenshot from the MedCrum video, Zach, if you would, before I read the epilogue here. Um, <laughs> He says, we need to start doing randomized control trials on sunshine exposure. 
being outside. And wouldn't wouldn't that be a thing? Yeah. Right? <clears throat> wouldn't that be a thing? And it would be um, cruel and inhuman to restrict some people to inside if almost everyone weren't doing that to themselves already anyway. Right? Okay. This is the afterward. Uh, just two pages uh, from Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. In January of 2020, so just a reminder, um, we uh, submitted the first draft of this book in March of 2020, just before uh, lockdowns began from COVID, and of course it went through a you know a number of a number of reviews and edits and such. Um, but this book was written the fast bulk of this book was written before COVID was a known thing, um, but the afterward was written afterwards. In January of 2020, we went to the Tipitini Biodiversity Station in the Ecuadorian Amazon to finish our first draft of this book. When we emerged from our isolation, as our phones came alive for the first time in two weeks, we were confronted with a barrage of news, mostly trivial, of which we had been blissfully unaware. But in that onslaught, there was one ominous report, a case of a novel coronavirus in Ecuador. The pathogen came from horseshoe bats, had jumped to people, and then spread rapidly, first in Wuhan, China, and then beyond. As the two of us tried to make sense of these first hints of pandemic, it quickly became clear that there might be more to the story. Wuhan, we soon learned, housed a BSL-4 laboratory. It was, in fact, one of our planet's two main centers of research on bat-borne coronaviruses. These viruses were being studied in Wuhan and in North Carolina because of fear among scientists that such viruses could jump to people and, without very much evolutionary change, cause a dangerous pandemic. If nothing else, the fact of the pandemic having begun in one of two cities where these viruses had been under intensive study seemed a spectacular coincidence. As of the writing of this note in late May 2021, the consensus in the scientific establishment, including national and international regulators, and in the mainstream press that follows them, has finally shifted to one of grudging acceptance of the obvious. I will say it has since shifted backwards <laughs> somewhat. Um, SARS-CoV-2 may well have leaked from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and the COVID-19 pandemic might therefore be for humanity an entirely self-inflicted wound. The strength of this hypothesis is something we have been discussing on our podcast, Dark Horse, since April of 2020. Those discussions caused a great deal of derision and stigma to be directed at us, and it is a bewildering relief to watch the world suddenly come around to the plausibility of this well-supported, if unfortunate, explanation. But no matter what humanity ultimately concludes about this pandemic's origin, there is a deeper truth hovering just outside our collective awareness. COVID-19 is a product of technology, no matter what path it took to humans. Consider this fact. From the beginning of the pandemic, the virus showed essentially zero capacity to transmit outside. Put another way, COVID-19 is a disease of buildings, cars, ships, trains, and airplanes. More than 99% of the Earth's surface is a COVID-safe zone. Even in your own backyard, the virus will struggle mightily to infect anyone. It has no meaningful impact unless you caught it before you walked out. In the park, on the balcony, at the beach, we are, at least for now, immune. The dependence of the virus on enclosed spaces also means that, had humanity agreed to avoid these vectoring environments for a few weeks, the pandemic could have been quickly brought to a halt. But this scenario in which we free ourselves and lock down dangerous environments instead is little more than an idle thought experiment. Even though in evolutionary terms these dangerous environments are all brand new to humans, the idea of humanity staying outside of them even for just a few weeks is unthinkable. Many individuals could do it, but the majority would be at a total loss, even though we evolved outside and despite the fact that most of our ancestors would have spent every hour of their lives in what we now strangely call the outdoors. We have forgotten the skills we once knew so well. That knowledge of and comfort with our natural environment has been replaced with a different skill set, one tuned to pursuing value and avoiding harm in a synthetic environment of our own device. Our cognitive software has been rewritten, and we have forgotten too much to ever again be what we were. As a result, we are condemned to battle this pathogen in bespoke environment, environments on which we and it have been both grown to depend. That's the view on the ground, but the human dimension of this pandemic is even clearer from 30,000 feet, or more accurately, at 30,000 feet. For it is the way that we have begun to travel that really set us up for pathogenic disaster. SARS-CoV-2 crossed oceans and hours, and it didn't pioneer some ingenious new mode. Where once an epidemic might have been held back by barriers that limit human travel, humans now regularly transmit communicable diseases from their continents of origin to every corner of the globe. Much as people thought little about washing their hands prior to the germ theory of disease, we give no thought to the scale of misery caused by a given person transporting a new and nameless cold virus to some continent that was free of it the day before. Novel coronavirus took advantage of that nonchalance before the pathogen even had a proper name. The COVID-19 pandemic is itself a symptom of another disease entirely. In the pages of this book, we call that disease hypernovelty. It is caused by a rate of technological change so rapid that transitions in our environment outstrip our capacity to adapt. 
You will not find the COVID-19 pandemic specifically dissected here, but you will find a full exploration of the hypernovelty crisis that left us vulnerable to this virus, a virus so weak that it could have been cured with a bit of well-coordinated fresh air. So prescient again, I think. Yeah, no, it, uh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit chilling uh, to hear that analysis from, was it May 2021? Yeah, we wrote that in May of 2021. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, yeah, uh, I hate to keep patting ourselves on the back, but, mm -hmm. uh, prescient again, um, at many different levels, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so we are where we are. I wonder where we'll be a year from now. Indeed. Indeed. Indeed.